Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 15 of Arrow 4080. This time the topic is frame elements in two dimensions. Let's take a look at how that works. So before we get started, it's good to remind ourselves of what we've already learned about beam elements. Now, beam elements are elements that basically have stiffness for bending for transverse loads. This introduces the degrees of freedom for vertical displacements or transverse displacements and for rotations, tangential rotations. This beam element that we're learning from Logan is analogous to a C-beam in Nastran that has no axial stiffness, only bending stiffness, which Nastran, you can't control that other than just changing the area to be tiny, 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 okay? We learned two ways of analyzing beam elements by hand, and we focused on when the beam elements are aligned with the global coordinate system. We learned the stiffness matrix for just transfer spending when we only have normal stiffness, stiffness for normal loads, which is our first local stiffness matrix, and we learned how to introduce shear deformation or shear flexibility by including some extra terms under this phi. So that's what we know so far and now we're going to move into frame elements. Now <clears throat> before we move into frame elements though we can translate what we already know about beams aligned with the global coordinate system to extend that to be a two-dimensional beam element, which means a beam element that isn't only aligned in the global coordinate system. We're going to proceed in a similar manner to what we did before by identifying our coordinate system as we see here. We're going to define our transformation matrix. Once again, we're using the direction cosines in a matrix fashion. And then we can see that we can translate our uv global coordinates to u prime v prime for any rotation using a transformation matrix like this one. This relates our global displacements to our, tra our uh, transformed uh, coordinate system to our other axis or the axis of the beam, the local stiffness, the local coordinates. So the transformation matrix for a two-dimensional beam element, I'm calling it a TB2D, is given like this, which will transform those. Therefore, we can transform that local matrix in the same way as we did before by taking pre and post multiplying the local stiffness matrix for each and every element by its own transformation matrix. This ends up creating this global stiffness matrix. Now, if we were doing this by hand, it would probably be easier to just construct this global matrix directly. But if you're using your calculator, if your calculator has the power to do this, is uh, many most of you should have TI style or similar uh, calculators, then it's easier to define your local and then just pre and mo post multiply by the transformation matrix as shown here. Okay, so now using this approach, we can transform what we know about uh, our beams aligned with a global coordinate system to beams aligned in any other coordinate system within a 2D system. Okay, now with that said, we're ready to introduce the frame element. And what Nastran, or excuse me, what Logan calls a frame element is just a beam element that also has axial stiffness. So instead of only having transverse stiffness and rotation, we now have axial stiffness, just like the rod. Now remembering that if we have a rod, which Logan calls a truss, we have that first, uh, this first mm, relationship between the forces, the local forces and the def local deflections, and for a beam, we have the second relation between the local forces and moments and the deflections, transverse deflections and rotations. Now we can combine these, right, as shown here. Now what we've done is we have axial 
shear and moment for each and every node related to the uh, axial deflection, the transverse deflection, and the rotation at each and every node using this relation. Okay, therefore our local element stiffness matrix is given by this last equation on the leftmost column and our transformation matrix is the combination of the two transformation matrix for matrices for axial elements, truss elements, and beam elements, which looks like this, which we're calling a TF2D because it's a two-dimensional frame now, what we're calling a frame. Remember, this nomenclature from Logan for truss elements, which are axial elements, beams, which are transverse elements, frames, which have axial and transverse, is different than the nomenclature with a Nastran, where a rod has only axial and torsional stiffness, a beam, whether it's a C-beam or a C-bar, can have axial, shear, moment, and uh, other stiffnesses. Okay. We can now transform our local stiffness matrix in the same manner, and that means the global stiffness matrix looks like this. Once again, and then over here to the left, we've got, uh, looks like a couple of my uh, timed deals on my slider out of speed. In the leftmost column, we see right after our third equation there, we see C1 and C2 are defined as AE over L and EI over L cubed. On the rightmost column, we see, wow, if we were doing this by really by hand, we're writing out and punching in every number in our calculator, it's easier to make the global stiffness matrix directly by just multiplying in these direction cosines into the matrix. But once again, since we have these powerful calculators in our hands, uh, calculating the local stiffness matrix for a given beam, uh, and then pre and post multiplying by the transformation matrix, probably the easiest way and the most straightforward way to keep your analysis error free. Okay. Once we've done all this, everything else is the same as what we've already been doing. Okay. So let's summarize our method now for two-dimensional frames. Remember, since this is a two-dimensional frame, we can use this approach to analyze trusses, beams, or two-dimensional frame elements, right? It's just that this has more terms. So once again, we're going to model our system with the elements and nodes. We're going to determine the local stiffness matrix for each and every element. We now just have a new type to use. We're going to determine the transformation matrix for each and every element. We're going to transform the stiffness matrix into global coordinates and assemble the global stiffness matrix. We're then going to apply our boundary conditions and calculate our unknown dis displacements. We then use the unknown displacements to calculate the external forces and applied forces. We then use that with uh, the global displacements along with the global stiffness matrices to calculate the global forces at each and every node for each and every element. And then we can transform those global forces into local forces as we did before. Okay. We can also calculate stresses. Here is a couple things. It looks like I need to work on my timing. Here's a couple pieces that were left out as we kind of ran through that. Got that? So let's look at an example. Here is a frame which consists of a bunch of bars which have bending stiffness and axial stiffness. We have a load applied and we have some constraints. Great. So what we can see here, we take a look at this. It looks like we're going to have four nodes. We're going to have three elements. And these are frame elements because they're going to need both bending and axial stiffness. Without the axial stiffness component, this wouldn't work properly. Okay. We can see we have applied force at node 2 and applied moment at node 3. So our properties for this problem are given like this. And we're going to be looking for our displacements and our forces. So we're going to start off by writing the local stiffness matrix for each and every element. Once again, these are frame elements. So we're going to use our big frame element local stiffness matrix. I like to echo my nodes. These are where the nodes are located. You'll notice these are feet, not inches. Therefore, we need to convert to inches to have consistent units. And then we can see for each of our 
elements, we can see uh, we're going to attach element 1 is from 1 to 2, 2 is from 2 to 3, and 3 is from 3 to 4. We don't have uh, separate stiffness or a uh, area information. We just have this I. We have our E. Oh, this is actually an error. It looks like I have a mistake in my code. Actually, a couple mistakes. This is spitting out the wrong units. And also, you'll notice it has our area zeroed out. I'll have to take a look at the code and see why those didn't pop out here. Okay? And then I'm repeating the uh, direction cosines for each and every element here and its length. Okay? With that all said, we're now ready to proceed by writing our local stiffness matrix. Once again, we write the local stiffness matrix and we write the transformation matrix. We can calculate the global stiffness matrix in this manner and that gives us these three uh, global stiffness matrices for our two, our three elements. Once we do that, we can now construct, once again, we're going to number our nodes. We've got the axial, transverse, and rotational deflection for each and every node. That's going to give us three rows and three columns per node. And when we write out our system of equations and construct our global stiffness matrix, we get something that looks like this. 3, 3, 3, 3. Right? Okay. With that said, we then look and see node 1 is fully constrained, which means those rows and columns are gone. We see that node 2, or excuse me, node 4 is also fully constrained, so those rows and columns are gone. That leaves us a reduced system of equations. When we take a look at this, this means we have nodes 2 and node 3 are free in the axial direction, in the transverse direction, and in the rotation direction. We know at node 2 we have a force in the global x direction. Everything else is 0. And at node 3 we have a moment. If our x is to the right and our y is up, this is a z moment, positive z moment at node 3. And the other two values are 0 for that one. We can now use this, those knowns to solve our reduced system and get our displacements. And that's what we're going to do here, where we calculate our displacements. That gives us the displacements at the two uh, at nodes 2 and 3, the two free nodes. We now can use those displacements to calculate the forces that we don't know, which is our constraint forces in these this cases. And that gives us this value here. We then can go and take the displacements for each and every element, which means for element 1, we're going to need the displacements at 1 and the displacements at 2 to calculate the global forces. And we do that for each and every element. And then we can multiply those global forces on the element by the transformation matrix to get the local forces on the element. These are the forces. This is a Fx. It's axial load, Fy is a shear, and Mz is a moment. These are the values we would then take. We want to analyze this for stresses. We can either do that electronically, or we can just take the axial load, shear, and moment, and calculate the Vq over It and the Mc over I for each and every node, being careful for the direction. And then we could go and use these values to draw for example, the shear and moment diagrams. So that's how we analyze frame elements, which is basically a bar with transverse stiffness, axial stiffness, and rotational stiffness. Enjoy.